All right, here we are, Gospel of Matthew, Matthew for Beginners. This is lesson number nine, entitled uh, Ministry to the Many and Ministry to the Few. If you're following along in your Bibles, uh, it is uh, chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13, and we're doing narrative number four. Um, in chapters 13 to 17 of Matthew, uh, we find the fourth narrative. And uh, we also get the final information concerning Jesus' ministry in the northern part of the country, uh, around His birthplace and His adult dwelling place. After this here, what we're going to be discussing today, He will go up to Jerusalem uh, and that particular uh, area to continue His, his ministry. Uh, what, we're going to, uh, what we're going to be going over today also uh, is the last of the great miracles recorded by, by Matthew. Uh, there are going to be a few more miracles to come, but the final miraculous signs of His divinity will be performed here among the people of His uh, hometown. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000 and then the feeding of the uh, 4,000, um, especially for his chosen disciples, certain miracles that he would do uh, for, his, uh, for his apostles, uh, the walking on water, healing and casting out of demons, the transfiguration, uh, the paying of the tax with a coin found in the, uh, in the mouth of a fish. Those are uh, private miracles that only his apostles were witness to. Uh, there's even the healing of a Gentile woman's daughter as an act of compassion and also as a sign of things to come when the gospel will be brought to all and not to uh, the Jews only. So after his Galilean ministry in the north, in this section, Jesus will then go uh, to the south towards Jerusalem and finish his ministry there. And when he gets to Jerusalem, uh, he will do more teaching. Of course, there'll be more confrontations with the Pharisees. Uh, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, the judgment on Jerusalem and the prophecy, and then uh, followed by His passion, what we refer to as His uh, suffering and death and then resurrection. However, so that's all to come, but for now, while He is in uh, the safer and more familiar surroundings of His uh, hometown, Jesus establishes, especially with His disciples, His identity and he begins to prepare them for the rejection that he's going to suffer at the hands of the leadership and also at the hands of the people when they eventually go to Jerusalem. All right, so let's begin with uh, chapter 13. I don't normally read you know, a lot of these sections, hoping that you're going to read ahead, but I do want to read this section here in, um, in Matthew uh, 13, beginning in verse 53. It says, when Jesus had finished these parables, He departed from there. He came to His hometown and began teaching them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom and these miraculous powers? Is, he not, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas and his sisters? Are they not with us? Where then did this man get all these things? And they took offense at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his own household. And he did not do many miracles there because of their disbelief. At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the news about Jesus and said to his servants, this is John the Baptist. He has risen from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are, are at work in him. For when Herod had John arrested, he bound him and put him in prison because of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip. For John had been saying to him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Although Herod wanted to put him to death, he feared the crowd because they regarded John as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday came, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod so much that he promised with an oath to give her whatever she asked. Having been prompted by her mother, she said, give me here on a platter the head of John the Baptist. Although he was grieved, the king commanded it to be given because of his oaths and because of his dinner guests. He sent and had John beheaded in the prison. And his head was brought on a platter and given to the girl, and she brought it to her mother. His disciples came and took away the body and buried it. And they went and reported to uh, Jesus. 
Uh, the reason I, I read this here is because I want you to see the nature of the rejection that Jesus is uh, uh, suffering at this point. Uh, first of all, there's the rejection by His own hometown in Nazareth. And then added to that is the killing of John the Baptist by Herod at the national level, which spells out you know, his own ultimate rejection by the people. In other words, you know, uh, when your own hometown rejects you and then you know, when John the Baptist is killed, you know, today we would say, uh-oh, the writing is on the wall, so to speak. The people who knew him best and witnessed not only his teachings and his miracles, but also his pure life, completely reject him, even his family in, in Nazareth. And then Herod at the national level, uh, who believed John to be a prophet, and Herod knew that John was very popular with the people, and he also knew John's connection with Jesus and had him killed anyways. So that was a, a clear signal to Jesus of Herod's lack of faith, obviously, and not only that, but his contempt. You know, it doesn't matter what the people think. It doesn't matter that he's popular. It doesn't matter even that I think maybe he's a prophet. He had him killed anyways. So with this evident rejection replayed, or displayed rather before him, Jesus continues to minister to the people and he continues to teach and preach to his disciples. So uh, the point I'm making is despite the rejection, despite you know, things are starting to get uphill, uh, things are starting to get difficult, Jesus continues in His ministry to the masses, to the many, and His ministry to His disciples, or uh, most specifically His apostles, ministry to the few. So let's look at the ministry to the masses that He continues to do during this time. Matthew records in this section Jesus' compassionate care for the people. Uh, he, doesn't, um, he doesn't record any parables or sermons in this part, only His benevolent ministry for the people who came out to Him for help and for healing. And so if you have your outlines, you know, I give you outlines you, 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 you know, where we outline the, the content of the material that we're covering from lesson to lesson. So if you're following that, you'll see there's the feeding of the 5,000, uh, who had followed him out to the wilderness when he had gone out to uh, pray following the death of, uh, uh, following the death of uh, John. Uh, the healing of the sick, you know, people were being healed simply by touching his uh, cloak in chapter 14. Uh, the healing of the Canaanite woman's daughter who uh, came to him begging for help. Jesus reminding her of his primary mission to the Jews first, but she appeals to his mercy and is immediately rewarded. Read about that in chapter 15. Uh, we see him healing the blind and the lame, those who cannot hear or speak, those who are crippled, uh, those who were brought to him by others for help. Uh, he heals them all, cares for all of them, chapter 15. And then there's the feeding of another group who had followed him for teaching and for healing in chapter 15. And then the healing of an epileptic boy upon the father's desperate request. You know, in verse 17, famous things that the father says, you know, I believe, but help my disbelief. You know, that, that section. Jesus heals his son. So many of these people ultimately rejected him, but Jesus continued to demonstrate his divine nature through miraculous healings in the compassionate service of the people who needed help and who came to Him. Um, another section that we're going to look at is the responses uh, that Jesus makes to His accusers. So you know, all of these things are happening at the same time. The rejection and, and the pushback from the people and Herod, what he's doing. And, and Jesus is busy ministering to the masses and teaching His apostles, and in that mix you have the Pharisees constantly attacking and trying to uh, undermine him. And so we read about that uh, in this particular uh, section. Now, the rejection that he suffered, of course, was spearheaded by the Pharisees and also the priests, the Sadducees, who despite seeing the miracles and hearing the teachings, they refused to accept the conclusion that these things pointed to. 
Instead, they wanted to discredit and to destroy Jesus in order to protect their position and of course to hide their own selfishness and sinfulness. Uh, they themselves did not teach with the authority, certainly not with the authority that Jesus had, and they twisted the scriptures to their own advantage. They did not help the people or provide for them, they merely manipulated them, of course, again, for their own position and their own advantage. So in chapter 15, we, we get a kind of a close-up view of this, of this uh, undermining, this attack by the Pharisees. Um, one of them is the accusation that he is breaking tradition or transgressing the tradition in chapter 15. Um, and it says that the Pharisees come from Jerusalem. Remember, we're talking about Jesus. He's in the north. He's in Galilee, his hometown. And it says that the Pharisees from Jerusalem go to the north, find him out, and challenge him. The idea that they were from Jerusalem is the same as today. They were with the, quote, the federal government. Okay. They had more authority than the local scribes. And so they accuse him of violating the, quote, tradition of washing before eating. Now the tradition that they're talking about, or the halakha, was a set of rules, 631 rules, that were set as a fence around the law by rabbis in order to make sure that no one broke the law. Now these included all kinds of rituals and procedures and rules that were actually conceived and enforced by religious leaders but really had no authority from the scriptures themselves. It was a kind of a better safe than sorry type of attitude. And so the washing of hands in order to make sure uh, that you weren't defiled by touching something a Gentile may have touched, and then if you touched yourself, then you became defiled uh, because you, know, you touched something that a Gentile touched, and so that touch was on you, and so therefore you were defiled. Uh, and so you had to go through a whole long process to purify yourself. Well, that rule did not exist in the law. The law said that, uh, uh, the law required rather, that there was no mingling with the Gentiles, meaning you weren't allowed to marry a Gentile, or you weren't allowed to worship with a Gentile. But there was no law about you having to wash if you touched something. You know, the, the law did not contain that. It was these uh, 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 additional rules that were created that uh, spoke to this idea of washings and purification and so on and so forth. And as happens you know, with a quote federal type of system, you know, uh, one big government and so on and so forth, they started to have rules and more and more rules. And eventually the rules became as important as the actual law itself. Jesus, of course, brushes aside their accusations by confronting them with how their traditions actually broke the very law that they were trying to uphold. And he doesn't talk about the washing, he talks about another uh, another subject, and we read about that in chapter 15. Again, I, I'd like to read these verses. He says, and Jesus answered and said to them, why do you yourselves transgress the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother, and he who speaks evil of father and mother is to be put to death. But you say, whoever says to, the, to his father or mother, whatever I have that would help you, has been given to God. And so uh, Jesus here is uh, referring to uh, the Korban. Uh, he's talking about a tradition that permitted them to avoid uh, caring for their parents by saying to their parents that, you know what, you know the money that I've got that should be going to help you in your old age, I've already committed that to the temple. You know, I've already, I've, that money's committed. It was in their possession, but they would say, you know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm, I'm committing it to the temple, so therefore I, I really can't give it to you, all right? And then of course when the parents died, they would uncommit the money and then use it. So Jesus is calling them on this. He accuses them of breaking the law, which you know, required them to care for their parents, you know, to honor their parents, you know, that was what the law said. So he accuses them of breaking the law, by hiding behind their tradition in order to cover their greed. 
So in the end, Jesus responds to the earlier accusation by explaining that men are defiled or made impure, not only by, excuse me, they're made impure not by what goes inside of them, by food or touching something, but by what comes out of them, lies and adultery and greed and so on and so forth. And by implication, he condemns the Pharisees of impurity and defilement because of what came out of them. And what came out of them were these greedy uh, uh, attitudes uh, uh, in respect uh, to the care of, their, uh, care of their parents. So then the Pharisees come back at him. They don't, you know, <laughs> it's kind of a debating trick. They accuse him of something. He answers them. He puts them in their place. He challenges them. And they don't respond. They simply move on to something else. And so uh, you know, that's a kind of a debate maneuver. You know, don't answer the question, just you know, make another thing. So now what they do is they ask for a sign. In chapter 16, uh, verses uh, one, to, uh, one to 12. Again, as in chapter 12, they ask for a demonstration of His power as a special sign or signal to them personally. You know, they're saying, hey, show us a sign. If you are who you are, show us a sign according to what we want to see. And Jesus responds in the same way. He says, you know, this request demonstrates the evil and disbelief in their hearts. It's not a sincere request because it wouldn't lead to faith anyways. I mean, Jesus could have, you know, when I say they wanted a sign, they wanted a sign like from the heavens or something, manna coming down, you know, that kind of sign. And Jesus knew he could stop the sun in the sky, he could make the sun disappear even, and they still, they still wouldn't believe. You know, it's not like Thomas, you know, we talk about doubting Thomas. Thomas, you know, he said, I, you know, I've believed and now I've been disappointed and I won't believe until I see it. And Jesus said, okay, here's the sign. And Thomas, you know, he believed, he confessed. Why? Because he sincerely wanted a little more proof so that he could believe. These men here, these Pharisees, they didn't want to believe, they simply wanted to trip him up. So he does answer them though. He tells them what sign to look for, the sign of Jonah, in other words, the resurrection. So Jesus warns his disciples against the teaching and the schemes of the Pharisees who will be their chief opponents in the future when they will be establishing the church. So we've got the ministry to the many, right? The healings and the, you know, turning the, uh, you know, the feeding of the 5,000, the 4,000, so on and so forth. We've got the one-on-one, uh, -on -one, uh, if you wish, uh, debate, attack of the Pharisees, Jesus dealing with them. And now we move to the ministry to the few. And this is Jesus' ministry to His um, apostles. And He does this in a variety of ways. He does it through miracles. Uh, walking on uh, water, if you wish. The first one is the walking on water, famous uh, miracle, famous, I say, I should say, familiar one. Matthew 14, uh, we know the story. Jesus sees them having trouble in the storm. You know, they're rowing across the lake and He comes to them walking on the water and, and, and Peter leaves the boat and he walks on the water also for a time. And of course he doubts and you know, he learns an important lesson of faith. But the thing that's really interesting about this story here is that in verse 33 of Matthew 14, it says that once that Jesus comes back into the boat with Peter and the, and the storm is calmed and so on and so forth, all of the apostles in the boat began to worship Him. Not just, not just Peter. All of them confess Him to be God's Son. Uh, his great personal miracles to build the faith of His disciples are demonstrated here by, uh, by Matthew. And then the other miracle, again, ministry to the few, is the transfiguration. Not, a, not even all the apostles are there. Only a few apostles see this one in uh, Matthew 17. Three of them, Peter, James, and John, they witness the visual brightness of Jesus' divine nature and His ability to communicate beyond time with Elijah and Moses. And we've said before, why Elijah and Moses? Why not someone else? Because Elijah and Moses represent something. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. And remember, Matthew is writing specifically with Jews in mind. And Jews 
will not accept who the Messiah is unless the Messiah comes according to the law and the prophets. And so Elijah and Moses represent uh, the prophets and the law. Now Luke and his, uh, we're not studying Luke, but Luke adds a little more information to this particular episode. He records that they spoke of his crucifixion that was to come. Uh, and then in this scene of the transfiguration, the voice from heaven confirms Jesus' role as one who fulfills all law and prophecy. To a Gentile, this would mean nothing. It would not be important to a Gentile. But if you were a Jew, it would be very important that the one you thought was the Messiah actually fulfilled all the things written about the Messiah by the prophets and in the law. So the instruction to hear Him, you know, when the voice comes in the cloud and says, hear Him, this means you need to listen to Jesus, not just to Jesus, but to Jesus as the final word of prophecy, the final word of the law. And then the other miracle, again, to the few, uh, the coin in the fish in Matthew 17 as well. Peter is asked by someone, how come you don't pay the temple tax? You think you're better than us? And you know, another way of trying to corner one of the, uh, uh, the disciples. And of course, Peter says, oh, sure we do. You know, he, <laughs> he tries to get out of it, he tries to bluff his way out of it. And Jesus knows. And Jesus tells Peter you know, to go fishing and he'll catch a fish and there'll be a coin in the mouth of the fish in order to pay the temple tax for both he and, uh, and the Lord. Now the idea is that it was ridiculous for Jesus, the Son of God, the Messiah, to pay tax on His own temple. But He did it anyways to avoid offending those who were still weak in the faith. And so He instructs Peter to do so. However, the way that it was done, once again, impressed Peter of Jesus' true identity. You see, those who didn't believe only saw a young rabbi pay his dues. Now for those who confessed Jesus as Christ, they saw yet another miracle uh, wrought before their very, very uh, eyes. And it makes me think you know, in Matthew 13, you know, when he says whoever has will have more, whoever doesn't have will lose whatever they already have. What's the point here? The point is, and, and we see it in these personal miracles, whoever has, well, has what? Has faith. Whoever has faith will receive even more. More what? Faith, no, more revelation. The, those who believe who have, they're going to receive more revelation. God will reveal Himself through Christ more and more. And for those who don't have, well, what is that? Well, those who don't have faith, what do they lose? Well, whatever little faith and whatever little things that they have, because they don't believe, they're even going to lose those things. So uh, uh, if, if all you have is what you have here on earth, wealth, riches, so on and so forth, whatever you have, eventually you're going to, you're going to lose that because one day you're going to die and you, know, you can't, bring it, can't bring it with you, okay? And so we see uh, that particular a saying that Jesus says back in Matthew 13 being played out here as the, um, as the apostles witness these miracles done specifically for them to build up their faith. Why? Because they're the ones who have. And because of their faith, God is giving them more. All right, so Jesus is ministering to the few with miracles and He also ministers to the few with teaching. All right, let's get there, there we go. Um, Jesus ministered to the apostles, as I say, with both miracles to build up and strengthen their faith, as well as provide for eyewitness accounts to bring others to faith. So he also continues his ministry through the teaching, and so a couple of teachings there, the lesson concerning what it is that defiles, remember we, we've already talked about that, Doesn't, it's not what goes in your mouth that defiles what comes out of your mouth, that's a teaching builds them up with that. Also the warning about the teaching of the Pharisees in chapter 16, and also Jesus' response to Peter's confession. So let's go to Peter's confession, right? Uh, chapter 16, verse 13, I think it's worth reading this. 
It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barhona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Uh, let's keep going, verse 18, he says, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, whatever you loose on earth shall, be, uh, shall have been loosed in heaven. So a lot of different ways that this passage, a very rich passage, uh, has been interpreted. So the, the miracles and the teachings over a two year period have built the faith of these men to the point where Peter, speaking ahead of the others, makes a full and complete declaration of what the parables and the miracles and the teachings pointed to all along. And what was that? That Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the divine Messiah. Okay, so once Peter makes that confession of faith first. The others follow through, right? Then Jesus is going to teach them beyond confession of faith. So far it was just to bring them to this point, you know, that they understood who He really was. Now He's going to teach them beyond this point. First of all, He says to Peter, without the revelation of the Son, in his teachings and miracles, he said Peter could never have known this. You know, when he says flesh and blood cannot, you know, flesh and blood cannot discern the spiritual things that Jesus was giving them. He said you can only know this through the revelation of God. The only way you can know God is if God reveals Himself to you. That's what I'm saying. I'm not talking about we each need a personal miracle to know God. No, what I am saying is if God didn't reveal Himself, we couldn't know Him. And through Jesus Christ, He makes the fullest revelation of Himself. And that's what Jesus is saying to Peter. Because God is revealing Himself through me, Peter, you get to know who God is, all right? That's why the gospel is the power of God to save men. What is the power of the gospel? It reveals Jesus Christ. It reveals who He is. That's the power. Then he talks to Simon and he says, Simon, that's the old man, right? That's the name his parents gave him, the old man. He says, Simon is truly blessed because of the confession of faith that he's made. Now he talks about Peter. Peter's the new man, the rock man. You know, Simon is, is, means like pebble, a small stone. Uh, 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 Peter means a rock, right? A boulder. So Peter is going to be stronger, better, because of this confession. And then he says, this revelation will be the basis for establishing the church, the called out. All right? So if Jesus wanted to say that He was going to build His church on Peter, right, the construction of the sentence would have been different. He would have said, and upon thee I will build my church. But he didn't, he didn't say that, right? He didn't say that. He says, you're Peter, right? You're a rock. And upon this rock, the word rock here is, means cliff, mountain. I will build, I will build my church. I guess the, the point I'm making here is that the rock upon which this indestructible church will be based is the reality that Jesus is the divine Messiah, not just the acknowledgement of that reality. You see what I'm doing? You know, this is an important difference. It's not what we think. You know, it, the church is not based on us saying you know, and understanding that Jesus is the Son of God. The church is based on the fact, the reality, that Jesus Christ is the divine Messiah. That's the rock upon which the church is built. The church is not built on Peter. The church is not built on Peter's confession. 
The church is built on the reality that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That's the cornerstone, that's the foundation, that's the church that we, that we build. And when we're preaching the gospel, and we're, when we're preaching that Jesus is the Son of God, the divine Messiah, we have set into place the proper cornerstone, the proper foundation to build, uh, to build the church. And that's what Jesus is saying this. A church built on that rock is not going gonna, is not gonna to fall. So to those who first believed and confessed, Jesus begins to outline the ministry that they're going to uh, that they're going to have. And the ministry that they're going to have, he, you know, he talks about the, the keys of the kingdom, I give you the keys of the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom is the ability to open the doors of the kingdom of heaven. Well, how do you open the doors of the kingdom of heaven? Well, what's the key? Well, it's the gospel. The gospel is the key. The message that they preach and, 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 and the message that, that is received by the people, that's what opens the door to the, kingdom of, uh, to the kingdom of heaven. Uh, uh, so what, what are the keys that, that, that Jesus gives to the apostles? Well, He gives them the gospel, right, number one, and He gives them the, the empowering of the Spirit to do miracles in order to confirm that what they were saying about the gospel was actually true. No one else could open you know, the, the, the doors of the kingdom of heaven. No one else but the apostles. Why? Because no one else but the apostles had received the gospel, the full gospel, and they had received it not only through teaching, but they had received it through an eyewitness of Jesus' miracles, His death, His, uh, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. They had been given all of that so that they could go out to preach. In addition to this, they received the empowering of the Holy Spirit that enabled them to do miracles. So there's the keys. I've got the message and I've got the power to confirm the message. And, and, and that's the key that opens the doors to the kingdom uh, of heaven. The idea of keys you know, comes from uh, uh, Isaiah and David, you know, key to the throne. It, it always means uh, uh, authority in the Bible. When he talks about binding and loosening, this is the authority to speak to uh, men here on earth uh, for God. Uh, in other words, the inspired writings to define the structure and the functioning of the church. They've also received that. And as they teach, uh, remember you know, in that passage, it says whatever they bind will have been, meaning it's already in heaven. So they're taking the information that is already set in heaven through the teachings of Christ, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and they're giving them to the church. So what they're building, what they're doing, what they're binding and loosening here is simply a reflection of what is bound and loosened in heaven. Okay? So they didn't, you know, they didn't invent the teachings, but whatever they instructed was already from heaven and thus confirmed. That's the idea of binding and loosening. You know, some people have interpreted that to mean that apostles and then preachers and other religious leaders have a right to change things, do things, and you know, oh, I have the right to bind. No. No, the binding and loosening, the only reason that whatever is bound on earth is bound in heaven is because it's already in heaven. And if you loosen it here, the only reason you have the authority to loosen it here is that it's already loosened in heaven. That's the point. Now there are many you know, varied interpretations, but in summary and in context of all that followed in their lives, these points explain well the meaning of Jesus' promise. He promises them. Now he, you know, he teaches them beyond their recognition that He is the Son of God. Okay, He says. You're going to build the church on this rock that I am the Son of God, the Messiah. And as you build it, as you build it, what you build here, you know, what, you, what you loosen and what you bind, you know, what you build here is already in heaven. Okay? Don't worry, it's already in heaven. In other words, you can speak with authority because you are speaking from the authority of God as the Holy Spirit inspires you. And then, uh, he not only uh, 
you know, goes beyond Peter's confession to tell them what they will be doing, the essence of their ministry later on. He also uh, goes on to give a prophecy concerning his crucifixion. Uh, in uh, Matthew 16, in Matthew 17, uh, in several places, uh, the momentous revelation through teaching and miracles uh, become tempered with the revelation also that in uh, the, the Messiah, uh, that uh, the Messiah rather, although him being divine was also to die a terrible death and, uh, and die with uh, utter uh, rejection by the leaders and the people. So you know, there's, it's like a high, low, good news, bad news type thing. Yes, you finally figured it out. Yes, good for you. I am the Son of God and we're going to build the church on that reality and you'll have the authority to build and so on and so forth. But before all of that happens, uh, there's this matter of crucifixion and death and resurrection. And so in, in giving him or giving them uh, this information, he teaches them several lessons. You know, first lesson is that the glorious resurrection is, is going to come. There's one lesson. It's not just suffering and death. It's not just rejection, okay? There will be a glorious resurrection. So don't, don't be discouraged and don't be afraid. Remember, he's preparing them for what's coming in the future. Secondly, the cost of discipleship is going to be high. In Matthew 16, 24 to 26, you know, uh, think before you commit. Realize that yes, it's all going to happen, but it's not going to be easy. And then he tells them that uh, despite everything that happens, everything that I have done, everything that you will do will be according to the prophets. In other words, I go back, uh, Matthew's talking to Jews. And so he's talking also, you know, the, the, the apostles were Jews, but Matthew's audience is also uh, the Jews. And he's saying all of this here, the Messiah is divine, that the Messiah would die and the Messiah would resurrect or would be rejected, so on and so forth. All of this that Jesus is saying to His apostles is also according to the prophets. And so for the apostles, it's a, it's a way to encourage them. You know, don't worry, you're doing the right thing because what you're doing has all been spoken of by the prophets. For those reading Matthew's record, uh, he's saying to them at this point, uh, everything that Jesus said and everything that Jesus did was according to the prophets and thereby establishing his legitimacy in the eyes of his Jewish readers. So with a mixture of faith in him as the divine Messiah and the knowledge of his you know, impending cross they are now ready to leave home and head for Jerusalem for the last time in order to face the unbelieving leaders and the difficult crowd and of course the terrible cross that he must go to. All right, we're going to stop here in this particular section. Next week, encourage you to read discourse number four and that'll be Matthew chapter 18 verses one to 35. We'll be covering that, all right? Thank you very much for your attention.